such a nice silence. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to the Royal Society this evening for this very special lecture. Let me introduce myself. My name is Lorna Castleton, and I'm one of the vice presidents of the Royal Society. I'm its foreign secretary. Uh, may I ask you, please, to switch off your telephones? It's very easy to leave them on, I know, but please, it will interfere with the electronics here. So please switch off your telephones. Um, now, the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award is funded by the Department of Innovation, Universities and Skills as part of its efforts to promote women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, something we call STEM. Uh, nominations for the 2009 award are open on the 1st of December 2008. So if you like this one, you might like to think of who you might like to see here, here next year. Um, Professor Maguire has been awarded the Rosalind Franklin Award in 2008 on the basis of her scientific achievements in cognitive neuroscience, her suitability as a role model, uh, and her exciting proposals to promote women in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Eleanor uh, Maguire is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging at University College London. She heads the Memory and Space Research Laboratory at the centre. Now, her research is concerned with how we can store a spatial representation of our environment and our ability to place ourselves within it. She has shown that our brains are plastic enough to undergo morphological change in response to requiring large amounts of spatial memory. One of her landmark observations, and I hope this doesn't spoil it, <laughs> is that the posterior hippocampus of London taxi drivers is larger than that of control non-taxi drivers, supporting the idea that the storage of, a large amount, uh, of large amounts of spatial data causes this region of the brain to enlarge. She obtained her PhD from the University College Dublin in Ireland, where she first became interested in the neural basis of memory while working with patients as a clinical neuropsychologist. Since then, she has continued to explore episodic memory and navigation by studying healthy human volunteers and patients with non-progressive pathologies using whole brain structural and functional MRI scanning and neuropsychological testing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to present Professor Eleanor McGuire. Well, thank you, Professor Castleton. Um, it's a real privilege to receive the Rosalind Franklin Award and to give this lecture today. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the Royal Society for this great honour and the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills for providing funding for me to undertake a project to promote the role of women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now, as many of you may know, um, Rosalind Franklin was a pioneer in her field and her work was critical in discovering the structure of DNA. Tragically, her life was cut short at the age of 37 um, and at a similar sort of age now, I feel I'm, like I'm only just getting going. So science really suffered with her loss. But her legacy lives on not only in her scientific contributions, um, but in particular as a, a role model for women scientists. Now, personally speaking, Rosalind Franklin has been an inspiration to me, illustrated in this quote from her, of which I'm uh, particularly fond. You look at science as some sort of demoralising invention of man, something apart from real life and which must be cautiously guarded and kept separate from everyday existence. But science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. So when my research fellows and myself are bogged down in some very challenging experiment where we're using naturalistic tasks to tap, in, tap into people's normal everyday behaviour, of which you'll hear more shortly, um, I take comfort in this quote. And so this leads me on to the main business of this evening, which is to tell you just a little bit about the sort of work we do. So basically, I'm trying to uh, find the answer to this question. 
how are memories formed, stored, represented and recollected by the human brain. So, given a lifetime of personal experiences and a shared culture of public events, how on earth does the brain manage to process this ongoing, complex, dynamic stream of events such that even decades after they occur, we can often recollect or re-experience the events in memory as richly as if they just happened. Well, let's start with some basic background about memory. And it won't be a surprise to learn that memory is quite a complicated business. It's not a unitary phenomenon. There are a variety of different types of memory, uh, ranging from short-term memory for things like phone numbers to skills such as riding a bicycle, uh, lots of general factual knowledge that we all accrue over a lifetime, and then the sorts of personal experiences and episodes that I've just alluded to, um, which are known as episodic or autobiographical memories. And these are the sorts of memories that will be the main focus this evening. Now, we also know that um, one region of the brain is particularly important for memory, um, and this is the hippocampus. Oh, sorry about that. You can see it in situ here, and just... Uh, in case there's any doubt, here it is flashing away, and you see we have a hippocampus on both sides. Now, focal damage to other brain regions rarely impacts upon the memory system in the same way as the dense and debilitating amnesia uh, caused by significant bilateral hippocampal pathology. Now, we know this because of pioneering work done in the 1950s by Brenda Milner, another inspiring scientist who just turned 90 this year and is still working. She studied a patient known as HM. Now, HM had um, a large part of his temporal lobe and hippocampus removed on both sides for the relief of drug-resistant epilepsy. Now, you can see here um, this sort of gap and this should have lots of tissue in it where his hippocampus should be. And you can see he only has a little remnant of hippocampus left on both sides, as well as large parts of his temporal lobe uh, missing. Now, post-surgery, HM was intellectually intact, so no problem on the old IQ front. Um, he was still able to learn some new skills. However, he was densely amnesic and he was unable to form new memories from that day onwards. And on this basis, Milner and colleagues identified the hippocampus as being crucial for forming new memories. Now, since the 1950s and HM, um, studies of patients with even more focal damage to the hippocampus than HM have confirmed this view and, interestingly, have also shown that the hippocampus is necessary for recalling past experiences, even those from many decades ago. Although the timescale of hippocampal involvement in memory is still a very hot and controversial topic. So how exactly does the hippocampus manage to support memory? Well, some very important clues come from work in non-humans, in particular rats. And in the early 1970s, O'Keefe and Ostrovsky discovered that there were neurons in the hippocampus that fired whenever a rat was in a particular location in space. So a certain part of a maze or a certain part of a square arena, for example. Now, crucially, it didn't matter what direction the rat was looking in, the cell still responded to a certain place. So if you look at this part of the slide here, you'll see a square arena, and the black lines show where the rat travelled around the arena. But you can see that it's only in this portion of the arena that this particular cell that's being recorded by the experimenter fired. So it was only interested in this particular place. So put very simply, these cells, which are now called place cells, unsurprisingly, um, seem to somehow code for the spatial memory for that location. But of course, these are rats. Uh, lovely as they are, the question is whether the human hippocampus is also involved in helping us find our way around. 
So this is one of our MRI scanners. And using functional MRI, or fMRI as we call it, which indirectly indexes neural activity in the brain, the hippocampus indeed activates when people engage in mental navigation or when they navigate around in virtual reality environments while we're scanning their brains. Now of note too, the hippocampus also activates when people recollect and richly re-experience personal past events. The hippocampus is active. So, in fact, what we're uncovering here is some fundamental questions that challenge cognitive neuroscientists who are trying to understand the neural basis of memory. How is it that the hippocampus supports both episodic memory, or memory for our personal experiences, whilst also enabling us to find our way around in the world. Furthermore, given the fact that um, the firing of place cells in rats can only be recorded in relatively small numbers of neurons at any one time, what does the activity of large populations of place cells look like? And how do they code for space? And particularly, how do they code for episodic memory? And so I'm going to touch on these uh, questions uh, throughout the rest of the talk. But there's another very important point to note. While the hippocampus is a key player in terms of memory, it certainly doesn't act alone. Recalling personal past experiences activates a wide network of brain regions as shown here in frontal, in temporal, and parietal regions of the brain. Uh, you can see our friend, the hippocampus here is active, but so are many other regions, both on the medial or deep in the brain and more laterally towards the surface of the brain. <coughs> Excuse me. And in terms of spatial navigation also, um, it too is associated with activation in many brain areas. And this is perhaps best illustrated um, by a clip from a study where Hugo Spears and I got participants to drive around a virtual reality version of central London while um, we were scanning their brains using fMRI. Now, the um, VR version of London um, was adapted from Sony's video game, The Getaway. And by complex means, which I won't go into here, um, we were able to ascertain the thoughts that the participants were having as they navigated around uh, London. And then we could observe the complex choreography of neural responses that accompanied them. So what you're going to see in this little video clip is you're going to see where the participant is driving. In fact, not a million miles away from here. It's actually Piccadilly Circus. Um, you're going to get a little aerial perspective of where the person is going. Up here, you're going to see the thoughts that they were having. And then you'll see the brain activity that accompanied those thoughts. Now, watch out for the hippocampus. It comes on very quickly at the start because that's when we found it, 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 the role it plays in navigation. It comes on during the initial planning of your route when you want to go somewhere. So watch out very quickly at the start. So let's have a look and see if this plays. Right, there's the customer. And there's the hippocampus there. He's planning his route. Now he's just kind of coasting along. Ah, he's changed his mind, so some frontal areas become engaged. He's trying a different route. Oh, and he's found something's blocked off he didn't expect. So an area of lateral frontal area comes on. He's planning some actions, so cerebellum motor areas are engaged. And then he's going down this street. He thinks the shops are very colourful and lots of activity in visual cortex. And then he's setting up some expectation. He expects to see something. And then another set of brain regions confirms the expectation. And there's a hint of a bit of road rage there. And <laughs> then he stops. So, in fact, what we have here is a situation where not only is the hippocampus involved in both episodic memory and navigation, but the two functions have an extended network of brain areas in common. 
And this is illustrated nicely in a recent meta-analysis by Sprang and colleagues in Toronto who collated data across a wide number of studies and looked at the overall patterns. And you can see the um, activations associated with episodic memory or autobiographical memory, as they're calling it here, in light blue and the areas activated during navigation in pink. And where they overlap is in red. And you can see that there's an awful lot of areas where the pink and blue are overlapping. So what's going on here? We, how is it that all of these brain areas, including the hippocampus, on the one hand help us to navigate and on the other hand support our autobiography? Well, this actually isn't that easy in a, a question to answer. We can certainly keep activating these areas with our fMRI scanners and with our memory and navigation tasks. But what does that really tell us? So we need something different in order to make some progress. So we thought, well, the recollection of episodic memories is widely accepted to be a reconstructive process. So memory is not a perfect <laughs> record of the past. In fact, a memory gets reassembled from its stored constituent components. And that's why memory is sometimes prone to errors. So Dennis Hassabis and I reasoned that if episodic memory were, was truly reconstructed, then some of the same processes should be co-opted by a purely constructive task that didn't involve memory. So basically, what happens when you take memory out of the equation and instead ask people to imagine fictitious experiences? So not to recall something that's happened to them in the past, but to create something entirely new and fictitious in their imagination. Well, we first examined this in patients with bilateral hippocampal damage. And you can see here, uh, we're looking at coronal sections, so we're like looking face on at the, uh, the scans of the participants. You can see a healthy control here, and you can see inside these circles the sort of plump hippocampi of a nice healthy control subject. And then here you can see four patients. You can see abnormal signal here and the shriveled or atrophied hippocampi in the other um, patients. And they all had dense amnesia. <coughs> and here's how the test worked. Basically, a participant was given a simple cue and then had to create a fictitious scene in their mind's eye and then describe it. So the example given here is, imagine you're lying on a white sandy beach in a beautiful tropical bay. And obviously, uh, we instructed participants not to give an actual memory or part of a memory, and we had various controls in place for that. So what we found was that the patients found it very difficult and, in fact, were impaired on this test relative to the control subject. So there's the four patients. And here's a group of age, IQ, and gender match control subjects. So the patients were impaired at imagining fictitious uh, experiences. And just to illustrate, here's a transcript of some descriptions. Now, you probably can't read that, so I'll just read quickly through them. So this is our tropical bay example. Um, and the patient says... As for seeing, I can't really, apart from just sky. I can hear the sound of seagulls and of the sea. I can feel the grains of sand between my fingers. I can hear one of those ship's hooters. That's about it. And then he's asked, are you actually seeing this in your mind's eye? No, the only thing I can see is blue. So if you look around, what can you see? Really, all I can see is the colour of the blue sky and the white sand. The rest of it, the sounds and things, obviously I'm just hearing. No, it's like I'm kind of floating. And then a control whose age, gender and IQ matched. And we had to, I've just cut this off for the slide. It's very hot and the sun is beating down on me. The sand underneath me is almost unbearably hot. I can hear the sounds of the small wavelets lapping on the beach. The sea is a gorgeous aquamarine colour. Behind me is a row of palm trees. I can hear the rustling every so often and so on. So you can appreciate um, that the... Um, Patients, they weren't absolutely devastated on this task. I mean, they were coming up with appropriate elements that you would find in such a scene or event. Um, but their descriptions are impoverished relative to the control subjects. 
And interestingly, even when we provided the elements for the patients, so we gave them pictures of what you would put in a scene, we played them sounds, they had smells that would all be associated with the scene, so they had it all in front of them, they still weren't able to perform any better. And the other important thing to point out is this wasn't a deficit in mental imagery ability. So they were able to very easily imagine single objects and elements that would go into a scene. And in fact, we were able to go on and identify the possible source of their deficit using what's called um, a spatial coherence index. And this basically measures the contiguousness or connectedness of the spatial scene. So the patients were actually unable, you can see the difference in performance here, to integrate the imagined experience into a coherent whole. So they couldn't put the elements together. They were all fragmented. And this manifested itself most obviously in the discontinuity of the spatial context. So the scene sort of lacked a spatial backdrop. So from this, we concluded that the hippocampus is not just interested or involved with memory, but plays a critical role in imagination by binding together the disparate elements of an event or scene. And then it seemed plausible to us that this may actually be what the hippocampus does when supporting the rich recollection of episodic memories, and perhaps when planning routes during navigation, when we often imagine scenes uh, as we plan our routes. Well, we then took this imagination task into the fMRI scanner in healthy volunteers um, and found that many of the same uh, brain areas were activated in common for both imagining fictitious experiences and recalling real episodic memories, including, of course, the uh, hippocampus. And we now also know that uh, from the work of Schachter and Addis in <laughs> Harvard, that thinking and planning for the future also engages the same brain areas, as does daydreaming. So basically, in the last 18 months or so, we've all realised that a whole lot of cognitive functions not just memory, depend on a common core network of brain areas, <laughs> including the hippocampus. Now, I should point out there are differences in uh, brain activity between these various cognitive functions, but I'm just going to focus today on the commonalities. And looking at these common activations, it suggested to us that there must also be a common core process underpinning these cognitive functions. And based on our imagination findings, Dennis Asabas and I have suggested that the common core process can be characterised by the concept of scene construction. And scene or event construction involves the mental generation and maintenance of a complex and coherent <laughs> scene or event. And this is achieved by reactivating, retrieving, integrating the relevant factual and sensory components stored in all the cortical areas of the brain, the product of which has a coherent spatial context or spatial backdrop. But the question is, what does each of these brain areas do in the service of scene construction? We have a little bit of an idea, of course, what the hippocampus might be doing, but what about all these other areas? So how are we going to deconstruct this network? Well, very recently with Jennifer Summerfield, uh, we've tried to do just this, again using imagination, because imagination is a very powerful tool, we feel. But this time, instead of getting participants to imagine a full scene straight off the bat, we got them to gradually build up scenes in their mind's eye from the elements that we <coughs> provided to them. So basically, they heard a set of sentences, one at a time, each describing a, an element that you would find in a scene. And it gradually built up over about 30 seconds. Um, and there were six sentences altogether. And they just had to imagine the scene <coughs> developing from these elements. So here's an example. So they had to imagine, for example, a large metal double bed, a dark, soft carpet, a fluffy teddy bear, a pale blue patterned wall, a wicker laundry basket, 
a brown leather purse. So they had 30 seconds over which they were hearing these additions to the scene gradually, and it had to build up <coughs> from the elements we gave them. And what we found was the usual suspects were activated in this task. So we got the usual core network uh, in response to people uh, building up these scenes. But critically, using this design, we're able to break down the big network into a set of smaller subnetworks and identify res different response profiles for the different subsets of brain areas. So what you're going to see is graphs that show you this. These are the six sentences, one to six. You're going to see the uh, response profile of the brain activity appearing, and then you're just going to see what, what areas were active in that way. So here we identified five different profiles. So this subset of regions in medial parietal areas and um, dorsal frontal regions were peaking at sentence three. That seemed to be what really interested these uh, areas. Interestingly, our friend the hippocampus and some of its uh, fellow network uh, areas, including parahippocampal gyrus, retrosplenial cortex, were doing something different. They were very interested when they heard the first element of a scene. Not so interested when you added another element, but again, very interested when you got to the third element of a scene. <coughs> and then sort of lost interest after that, weren't interested in any of the other elements. Uh, a different set of sub uh, areas in medial parietal, medial frontal regions show the same one sentence, three sentence profile, but then kept quite interested in the other elements as well. And then there were some brain areas that just loved getting more elements. The more complicated the scene, the more active these brain areas. And then some areas of medial frontal cortex that were only interested in sentence one. Now, I'm not going to go into a detailed interpretation of all these results, but what is interesting to note is that when participants rated um, they, their, their performance on this task, they very strongly felt that sentence three was when they first got a sense of the scene. So they had accrued three elements, and for some reason, that seemed to give them a definite sense of seenness. And it would seem that some of the brain areas were also showing um, this sort of response. So, in summary, what I'm suggesting is that by adopting a framework like scene construction and designing tasks that involve maybe using imagination, we can move forward in deconstructing the common core brain network that underpins so many vital cognitive functions such as episodic memory, thinking about the future, so important, and navigation. If we can identify the basic mechanisms that are at work within these brain regions that allows them to contribute to such a diversity of functions, then we might really start to understand how memory works and most importantly, how memory breaks down in the context of brain injury or disease. So understanding this core network is clearly very important. But within that network, it's still fair to say that the hippocampus has a privileged position. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to describe to you a recent study where we've implemented a highly focused examination of the human hippocampus. Now, I was trying to think about how best to give you a sense of what's quite a complicated study. Um, and then I was reminded of a film that came out about four years ago, which at the time I thought was totally ridiculous. Um, but now it's actually taken on some new meaning for me and my research fellows. So um, let me show you some clips. Uh, and we're going to start off with um, an advertisement. Hope this isn't too loud. Oh, that's not right. Oh dear, this isn't good.
And so, here's somebody who responded to Lacuna's ad. Okay, so in this Focus Films, um, features film, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the person from Lacuna Inc. suggests that they can, with sophisticated brain imaging, um, identify the pattern of brain activity that's associated with a specific episodic memory. Now, of course, this is just science fiction. Or is it? Well, let's see. Well, we know from work with rats that I alluded to earlier that the hippocampus contains place cells. But because only relatively small numbers of neurons can be studied, less than 100 at any one time, it's not possible to look at firing across whole populations of neurons. But does that matter? Well, yes, I would argue that it does. It's important to know how all the place cells operate together, and in particular, whether there's a pattern or functional structure in the firing of the neurons across the hippocampus. Now, in a totally unrelated illustration, um, but I think it makes the point, if you just have a look at this, it looks like a sort of random set of splodges, okay? But if you actually look at the bigger picture, what I hope you can see is that there is a structure in there, and in fact, uh, it's a picture of a Dalmatian kind of sniffing its way along a path. Now, this is a very famous example from the world of perception, but I think it makes the point. The question is, is there a pattern or functional structure in the firing of neurons across the hippocampus? Because if there is, it tells us something really important about how information is coded by the hippocampus. If there is a functional structure in the firing of hippocampal neurons associated with a specific memory, and if we can identify it, then it becomes possible to predict just from the pattern of activity in the hippocampus what somebody is remembering. So a sort of mind reading, if you like. Well, the current prevailing view is based primarily, primarily on rat uh, data. And that is that there is no topology or no pattern to the place cell firing, that it's essentially random and uniformly distributed. But without being able to record for many thousands of neurons, this really isn't certain. Now, a lot of people would say that um, using fMRI in humans is not the way to progress this issue because there's a big difference between recording directly from a place cell and the big old splodges that I've shown you on the fMRI scans. So really, perhaps it's a waste of time trying to look at population coding using fMRI. But we weren't put off by that. So with Demis Asabas, Carlton Chu, Geraint Rees and Nicholas Weiskopf, we decided to test this out, adopting techniques that have been used successfully in the domain of vision neuroscience. 
Now, I have to just digress slightly into a little bit of detail, um, just so hopefully you can follow what we did. Um, when we normally analyse functional MRI data, what we do is take memories of the same type, pool together the brain responses associated with those memories. We can't usually look at single memories on their own as the signal simply wouldn't be strong enough. We then look at the number of voxels that pass a certain statistical threshold. Now, a voxel is the smallest unit we can measure in a 3D brain image volume. So just to show you, this is, a, again, a coronal section face-on of an MRI scan. But if we zoom in, you can see that it's made up of smaller units. We call them voxels. They're sort of like pixels, if you like. Uh, and it, again, if I zoom in even further, you can see the voxels quite clearly. And the voxels in the study I'm going to talk about were 1.5 millimetres cubed. And this, we're, we're measuring signal, fMRI signal, from these kinds of voxels. And just to illustrate in a highly simplified fashion, but this is normally what we do in conventional MRI. Um, we measure to see, you know, if, if each of these is a voxel, each of these bars is a voxel, um, then what we simply say is how many of these voxels have passed a certain threshold of activation. So we have a certain threshold in mind and we just ask how many separate individual voxels pass this threshold and then we're quite happy with our result. Recently, however, a different type of approach has been developed that takes into account the patterns of response across multiple voxels. So if I show you a slightly different view of this graph, so this time we're looking down on the graph, what you can actually see is there's a bit of a pattern there. So the point is, important findings could be missed from conventional FM, fMRI data if information is represented in distinct patterns across voxels rather than in the number of separate individual voxels that reach a threshold of activation. So during high spatial resolution fMRI, we had um, participants navigate around a very simple virtual reality environment. So this one's a lot more simple than our virtual London. Each room contained four target positions, which participants were instructed to navigate between as quickly and accurately as possible after being extensively pre-trained. You can see the schematic, you can see the four targets. They're labelled here A, B, C and D, just for ease of reference. They weren't labelled like that in the actual environment. In fact, in the environment, the targets were visually delineated by identical cloth rugs on the floor. And this is one of the uh, rugs you can see here. And there were single objects placed along the walls just for orientation. You can see here a door and there's actually a chair there as well. Now, once a, 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 an intended destination was reached, the participant pressed a trigger button and then the viewpoint transitioned smoothly downwards as if they were bowing their head to reveal the rug on the floor, marking the target position. And at that point, a countdown started from five, five, four, three, two, one. We can see we're at three here. And then the label of the next destination was presented. The viewpoint shifted upwards again and navigation control was returned to the participant. What we did using some very clever maths, was devised an algorithm, which we call a classifier. And we divided up the data and used some of the data to train this classifier. So it learned, if we go back to our highly simplified um, representation of this, it learned that some patterns of brain activity were associated, say, with position A. Others were associated with position B and so on. Now, I should point out that we only analysed the data where the subjects were looking at the rugs, which were all identical in every location. So the importance of this is that 
the, only the internal memory of where the participant was distinguished the locations. Nothing in the, in the visual display distinguished the locations. So having trained this classifier, we then gave it the rest of the data, which it hadn't seen before, and said, OK, now you've learned what's what in terms of what pattern is associated with what position. I want you to tell me from this, uh, in this new set of data where the person was just by analysing the patterns of brain activity across voxels. It made some predictions and then we compared it to actually where the subjects were in the environment and calculated how well the classifier had done. And we found that the classifier had done extremely well indeed and was able to accurately predict where a person was in the virtual environment. And then we asked, well, where are the voxels that best told or made the distinction between the four positions? And lo and behold, we found across four subjects that the voxels that knew where the person was and was able to tell the difference between the four positions were slap bang in our friend, the hippocampus. Not in any other areas. Uh, and we did a, quite a large search space across the medial temporal lobes, just the hippocampus. So what we've been able to do here is discern patterns of brain activity across hippocampal voxels associated with specific spatial locations or memories. So we've decoded spatial memories from the hippocampal activity. And furthermore, this is a demonstration that across a very large population of hippocampal neurons, there's maybe 10,000 neurons in every voxel and dozens of discriminating voxels, that there is a functional structure and it's large, robust and predictable. Because if the firing of the population of neurons was instead random, and uniformly distributed, as some of the rat studies suggest, and as several computational models have assumed, then activity at the voxel level here would also have been uniform, thus making it impossible to do what we've done. So if we're able to, uh, from brain activity alone, decode where someone is, this opens up a range of intriguing and very exciting possibilities. Might it be possible, uh, like Lacuna Inc. suggest, to decode a specific memory that someone is recollecting just from reading out their brain activity alone? Now, this is an issue that's quite hard to look at in non-humans. Uh, first of all, because some people think that non-humans, like rats, don't have episodic memory. But even if they do, it's very hard, very challenging to try and discern ways of eliciting or testing for episodic memory. It's much easier to be able to talk to people because they can tell you what they remember. So given this technique, this, may, this way of approaching uh, issues might be an imp give important new insights into how place cells in the hippocampus relate not just to space, but also to episodic memory and in so doing may really help us to nail down how this critical brain uh, structure codes for our lifetime of experiences. So I'm just going to wrap up uh, with uh, some very important final notes. Um, obviously, the work I've described this evening is very much a team effort. Huge thanks go to all my uh, research students and fellows, past and present, to my many, many collaborators who are too numerous to fit on the slide, but thank you all. Um, and, of course, the support staff and my fellow principal investigators at the Wellcome Trust Centre for Neuroimaging who make it such a great place to work. And finally, of course, none of this would be possible without the enduring... Oh, the enduring support um, of the Wellcome Trust. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eleanor, for a really fascinating lecture um, with some lovely lovely movies for us to look at too. Um, and now I'm going to open this for uh, discussion or, or for questions. And please uh, 
If you want to ask a question, put your hand up and somebody on the side there will supply you with a microphone. And please, it would be nice if you tell us who you are when you do it. Thank you. Uh, here. Uh, my name is Armin Hennessy. I'm a mere observer of science. Um, I'm very interested in your uh, explain, explanation of the hippocampus in connection with spatial navigation. And I was wondering if memory and hippocampus behave differently with sighted people or blind people. That's a, a very interesting question. And there has been a bit of work done on that. Um, I personally haven't worked on it, but it is interesting to think how their spatial representations are. Um, just to, to side, go sort of tangentially briefly, we've done some work showing that, um, as uh, Lorna referred to at the start, that London taxi drivers show changes in their hippocampus related to structural changes related to navigation. Um, and what's interesting is in, in recent years, uh, similar kinds of changes have been found in congenitally blind subjects. So they have um, greater grey matter volume in their right posterior hippocampus. Um, and they also performed better than sighted control subjects on some kinds of navigation tasks. Um, now, obviously on others, they didn't perform quite so well. Um, but... I think there's increasing interest in this because if you can sort of look at what they're good at and how that might relate to their hippocampal volume changes, it might tell us something about how a sense of spatial orientation develops without visual input. Of course, sighted people rely so heavily on visual input. Um, but it's interesting that the hippocampus can be modified in the absence of visual input also. So I think there's still a ways to go understanding exactly... Um, what that tells us about navigation. But it's certainly an interesting population of, of people to study. Um, very quick, because we have others who want to Simply ask questions. Simply that if someone is blind, um, they'd be relying on their hearing, and my understanding is that sight and hearing are both spatial. Yes, so I think that's a, that obviously is, is one line or avenue how this might be occurring. Absolutely, yeah. One there. My name is Peter Hemming. I've got two very brief questions. Uh, firstly, well, one is an observation. You told us that that spotted diagram represented a Dalmatian sniffing the ground. Well, I wouldn't have realised it was a Dalmatian just by staring at it, but once you told me it was a Dalmatian, I found the longer I stared at it, the more clearly it became a Dalmatian and less likely to be anything else, you know? Um, in fact, I sort of scanned like that, you see, and it got clearer and clearer, a dimension, and couldn't be anything else. Now, the second uh, item is actually a question. The derivation of the word hippocampus, this suggests from Greek hippos, a horse. There are a number of English words which begin hippo. Um, have you any idea what the origin of the name hippocampus is? Yes, it's... it's um Origin is um, in the Greek for seahorse. So it was thought by early anatomists who saw the hip, the, this part of the brain that it quite resembled a seahorse. And if, if I, I have some slides that show you um, certain views of the hippocampus, and it does look quite like a seahorse. And so that's why they named it seahorse. In relation to your first question, I'm absolutely... The, the sort of um, Dalmatian... Um, stimulus I showed you comes from another field where exactly what you're describing um, they're interested in is looking at a picture where you don't have any sort of background or context and then suddenly having the context or suddenly having an aha sort of moment. That's what they're interested in. So I wasn't trying to make any kind of points about that except just using it to show that um, sometimes there is a structure even when things don't appear to be structured. Um, I'm not sure that it is. I think that's a very subjective test, um, whereas these are quite well-characterised stimuli mm -hmm. across many sort of um, groups of people. Another question. Yep. 
Uh, Andrew Withington. I'd, I'd like to ask about... Um, I've worked with people with post-traumatic stress disorder who have flashbacks, and flashbacks seem to be a different type of episodic memory from, from normal episodic memory. They don't seem to be constructed. So do you have an idea about in how that would be neurally represented? That's a very interesting question in terms of... I mean, the, we're just starting to get to grips with the notion that... Um, this range of cognitive functions might have a, a common core network. And I think we do need to start considering exactly those kinds of memories to see do they fit into our characterisation like scene construction. Um, I think scene construction is something that happens extremely quickly. What we tried to do in our experiment where we had pe people build up the scene was we've tried to artificially slow it down so we could at least have some chance of seeing how the brain areas respond differently. But I think in everyday life it happens incredibly quickly. And so I wouldn't be too sure that it's not... Um, drawing on the same kinds of processes and brain areas um, as, as sort of ordinary, non-traumatic, episodic memories. Um, but it is something very interesting that we need to consider. Yeah. Uh, one over there. And I, I forgot to ask you to stand up when you answer your questions. <laughs> Evidently, the camera gets you better. Um, I'm Jonathan Tam from Westminster School. Um, I was just wondering, that last experiment which you described, um, you talked about how the different structures of neurons firing can um, kind of pinpoint a memory and give it, um, differentiate from other memories, so, uh, from, other, from, other, um, from, other, from other memories, so your algorithm, algorithm could determine where you were in the room. Um, it kind of struck me that that was you said yourself was quite a specific, contrived environment. Um, and you said that that could perhaps be generalised further to almost to read someone's mind, as it were. I was just wondering how, in perhaps such a contrived environment, how it can be generalised over to a more subjective kind of contextual experience. Mm. So, because um, this was quite a, a sort of... Um, slightly anarchic thing to do, we started off with something that was quite controlled in terms of um, the stimulus that we used. Having satisfied ourselves that this is now possible to do, um, at the moment we're going on to try and look at much more realistic situations where people um, are remembering things that happened to them and so on. So um, I think that we will really test our algorithm under those circumstances. But I think it was very important for us to start off in the first instance with something that was fairly controlled so that we could really test the algorithm and the whole notion of whether or not there's some kind of predictable pattern uh, in these sorts of brain areas. But good question. I'm not coming. Could you stand up? <laughs> Hello, I'm Fiona Barakat from Westminster Kingsway College. Um, I'm just wondering whether you've done any research in the area of dreaming and maybe dream construction yeah. and whether the hippocampus is involved in dreaming and to what extent. <laughs> yeah. uh, another very good question. Um, so the hippocampus in rats, um, when they sleep, um, there's been some re research showing that some of the um, activity in place cells that activated during a task before they went to sleep gets replayed um, while they're asleep. And that's been sort of likened to perhaps um, a kind of dreaming situation in rats. Um, we think, uh, Demesis Abbas and I have speculated, that in fact dreaming could be probably added to our list of... Uh, I didn't put it up there because we don't have any evidence really for that. Um, but that may be exactly drawing on the same kinds of processes um, uh, as, as episodic memory and navigation. What's quite interesting is um, we did ask the patients with hippocampal damage whether they still dreamed uh, after their... Um, uh, amnesia started so they, they now can't remember the past they can't form new memories we've shown they can't imagine very easily and um, so we wondered do they dream now they all say they stopped dreaming but of course um, the problem is that they're amnesic so they might still dream but they might forget that they dream and this is actually a very serious problem in trying to re sort of research this um, so, uh, but I do think, we, I would put dreaming on the list, so yes. 
I, a good point. <laughs> One there? Sorry. Come back to you next, please. Uh, I'm Derek Yates, uh, also an observer of science, but with a mathematical background. Uh, two very quick questions. You mentioned that, uh, I think you said, only about 100 neurons or so can be observed uh, at one time. How constrained is your research by sort of the technology, and are there any technologies you know, on the horizon that will make a big difference so that you can, you can observe a lot more? And the second quick question is the algorithms you're using, what type of mathematics are they using? Just Okay. So the first question relates to um, taking recordings directly from play cells in rats. Um, I don't do that myself, so I can't really tell you very much about what technologies are on the horizon. It is very challenging, though. Um, in terms of what algorithms we're using, we're using support vector machines. Um, so it's a, a kind of standard type of um, pattern recognition type approach with some interesting twists to feature selection and so on. Lady in the red. I'm Pam Wayne from the Women's Engineering Society. And of course, some engineers are using very specifically um, spatial imagination. And I wondered whether you'd worked with anyone or related things like sculptors who are doing 3D imagining <coughs> quite frequently. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, we've obviously spent a lot of time looking uh, at taxi drivers, but um, it would be interesting to, to look at other subsets of individuals who rely heavily on spa other types of you know, spatial skills. We haven't done that, but I think it would be very interesting to do that. Yeah. And I don't know of any other groups that have looked at that specifically. One at the back there. Good evening. I'm Fabio Di Sio from the Wellcome Trust Center for the History of Medicine. And I was wondering, at some point you said that you referred to imagination to rule out the possibility to, in a way, put in brackets the role of memory in the functioning of hippocampus. Did I get it right? Yeah. I was just wondering how can you actually be sure this is the case, that at some unconscious level, memory still doesn't play a role, for instance, in the building of a room. And then I was um, wondering whether you have kind of interacted with psychologists, because I do think that this commonality of functions and structures you show tends to blur some, some traditional psychological categories, yeah. or whether you, I don't know, have had wild speculations about it yourself. I think your first question is, obviously, we thought about that a lot, is um, whether we can really divorce this constructive process from memory. Um, we did have a number of controls in place where we, you know, obviously we were urging subjects not to use memories. Um, they said they weren't using memories. Um, they rated them as very low in relation to memory. But that doesn't rule out, I guess, implicit um, drawing on memory. Um, what we're, we're trying to do now to sort of address these issues is to move towards these sort of tasks where we provide the elements of the scene. So uh, there's less of a chance that they will just immediately uh, focus on some memory that they have themselves, but they have to try and imagine things that we're presenting to them. But I think it's very important to understand within this, and I didn't have time to go into it, is to understand the relationship between... Um, our task and, and where the elements of a scene come from. So we're saying things get reconstructed, but those elements, of course, come from stored knowledge bases in the brain, which um, you, know, you can draw on, and arguably they're forms of semantic memory or abstracted information. So um, there is uh, memory is still in the equation in the sense that the elements are coming from somewhere, but it's not... Uh, we feel pretty confident it's not just simply a matter of all subjects implicitly using um, their episodic memories to perform this task. I would point out that there was another patient that I didn't have time to show who was profoundly amnesic. Uh, so he couldn't remember virtually anything that happened to him over his lifetime. 
Um, but he was able to do the imagination task. So that kind of shows that you don't need your episodic memory to do the imagination task. Now, he did have some activity uh, in his residual hippocampal tissue, so it seems like his whole system wasn't completely knocked out as it was in the case of the other patients. But I think it serves to show that it's not simply a matter of the construction tasks being episodic memory by some other name. And I've forgotten your second question. Sorry. Oh, yes, it was... Um, yeah, I think it does start to um, make us think more broadly about how these things we've previously categorised as separate actually are, are maybe all being fed by the same kinds of brain processes and, and algorithms within these brain areas. And I think it's certainly um, given new em, imp, sort of impetus to the field to think more widely and more globally. And it is quite new. As I said, it's basically in the last 18 months we've all sort of realised um, that the, there is this core network. Well, I have to call this question session to an end. I'm afraid we've run out of time. But I have something very important to do before we finish. Uh, now, I have these to present to Eleanor. So there's your scroll. Thank you very much. And there's your medal. Thank you very much. I I, th I think you'll all agree this has been a wonderful evening. We've had a wonderful lecture, and the fact that you're all here shows just how interested you are in this subject. Thank you all very much. <laughs>